Hi, and welcome to the Providence YouTube channel. My name is Emily. And my name is Jeremiah. And thank you guys for joining us for our third week series of... Name Drop. Woohoo! Yep, it's your first time here. We will love to connect with you and get to know you a little bit better. You can fill out our digital connection card, which you can find on our website, which is providence.church forward slash connect. Or you can text the word connect to this number, which is 346-220-0905. Again, that's 346-220-0905. And to stay up to date with videos just like this one, be sure to give us a like, ring that notification bell, and click the subscribe button so you can stay informed. Yep, that's all from us. Now with Pastor John. Well, I want to welcome all of you to Providence Church. How are we doing today? Man, I am so excited that you made the decision to join our service today. I believe that God has a powerful word for all of us. And so if you are ready to receive a word from God today, would you just shout out, I'm ready? Very good. Those of you online, if you would just type in, I'm ready in the comment section that we will know that you are right along with us as well. Well, my name is John. I'm the pastor here at Providence, and we are in week three of a lesson series we're doing called Name Drop. Real specifically, we are talking about the names of God. And what I find absolutely fascinating is the fact that the Old Testament writers had 85 different names for God. And this is so important for us today because each name reveals more and more to us about God's nature and about God's character. For example, when we started this series in week one, the very first name that we learned of God was the name El Roi, which means the God who sees me. Very powerful, powerful message that week. Then last week, we learned a new name for God. We learned that God is Jehovah Rapha, which means the God who heals. Well, today we're going to learn a third name. In fact, I'm going to put this name up on the screen right here. We're learning the name Jehovah Nisi. At least I think it's going to pop up on the screen any second now. Right there. Go for it. Hit it. Well, the name that we're learning today is Jehovah Nisi. And uh, some of you may be wondering, uh, is that a Japanese car? Is that the name for a Japanese car? Or does that mean that God likes imports over domestic vehicles? Well, the truth is Jehovah Nisi has nothing to do with automobiles, okay? Instead, the word or the name Jehovah Nisi means the Lord is my banner. In fact, turn to your neighbor right now and say, the Lord is my banner, well, to learn about the new name of God, Jehovah Nisi, we're actually going to be in the book of Exodus. And so if you have your Bibles, I want you to go ahead and open them up to Exodus chapter 17. We're going to begin in verse 8. But while you're turning there, I actually have a name drop story for you. I'm going to drop a name into my conversation. Now, many of you know that I am a huge Pittsburgh Steelers fan. I've been a fan of the Pittsburgh Steelers my entire life, going all the way back to the 70s. I can't believe I'm admitting that out loud to some of you. Uh, but because I'm a huge Steelers fan, my wife decided a couple of years ago that what she would get me for Christmas were these miniature Steeler helmets that are autographed by some of the Steeler greats. And so I have an autographed helmet by Mean Joe Green. I've got one by Lynn Swan. I've got one by Jack Lambert. And I, ju I just love these little mini football helmets. But the one that I brought today, I find very fascinating. I think it ties in with the lesson. The one I brought today is Andy Russell. Now, if you don't know anything about Andy Russell, Andy played linebacker for the Steelers back in the 70s when the defense was called the Steel Curtain. You remember those days? Andy Russell's a seven-time pro bowler. He's a two-time Super Bowl champion. And so Andy is a bad, bad dude. I mean, he's, he's a bad man. What's interesting about Andy Russell is that his name will forever be linked to some other Pittsburgh Steeler paraphernalia that many of you may know about. In fact, I've got one right here. It's called the Terrible Towel. How many of you have ever seen the Terrible Towel before? Well, if you haven't, all you got to do is go to a Steelers game, and what you'll see is every fan in the stands who's a fan of the Steelers, they'll have a Terrible Towel, and they'll be waving it just like this. What's interesting is that the Terrible Towel almost didn't happen. You see, back in 1975, the Steelers were about to go into the playoffs. They were playing the Baltimore Colts, and someone upstairs in the administration office decided we need something to really get the fans fired up. You know what I'm saying? We need something to intimidate our opponent. And so they came up with the terrible towel. Well, Andy Russell, he saw the terrible towel, and he thought it was a bad idea. 
He said, listen, the terrible towel is a gimmick. We're not a gimmick team, and we don't need a gimmick to win. And so everybody wasn't sure what was going to happen to the terrible towel. But during that first playoff game, Andy Russell actually returned a fumble, 93 yards for a touchdown. And when he did, everybody in the stands was going crazy with the terrible towels. And all I have to say is a new tradition was born. Or, or, or let me say it another way, the terrible towel became a banner representing the power of the Pittsburgh Steelers. And this one's really, really intimidating because it's got all six Super Bowl championships on it as well. Well, today we're going to be in the book of Exodus. We're going to be talking about a banner. We're not going to be talking about the terrible towel, though, okay? Instead of talking about the terrible towel, we're going to look at a different banner that represents the power of God. And so we're going to kick off uh, in verse 8, and I'm going to put all the verses in the screen. If you've got your Bibles, you can follow along that way. But, but here we go. Exodus chapter 17, starting with verse 8, says this. The Amalekites came and attacked the Israelites at Rephidim. Moses said to Joshua, choose some of our men and go out to fight the Amalekites. And tomorrow I will stand on top of the hill with the staff of God in my hands. Now, Exodus chapter 17 comes quickly on the heels of the Israelites being released from captivity in Egypt. For 400 years, the Israelites were enslaved in Egypt. That is until God sent a man named Moses to talk to the Pharaoh to set the people free. Well, Moses uh, did talk to the Pharaoh. The Pharaoh did set the people free. And from that point forward, God began to lead the people of Israel to the promised land. But instead of taking the short route, Instead of taking the direct route, God decided not to take the Israelites north, but instead he took the Israelites south. He took them the roundabout way. They left the Red Sea and they headed out into the wilderness of Shur, and they were supposed to make it all the way down to Mount Sinai where God was going to give Moses the Ten Commandments. But on the way, as they're marching to Mount Sinai, the Amalekites, they actually see the Israelites. And they take a look at the Israelites and they think to themselves, man, this is an easy target. This is going to be like taking candy from a baby. And so the Amalekites decide that they're going to engage the Israelites in battle. Now, if you were with us last week, you remember me saying that God actually took the Israelites the roundabout way so that they could avoid their enemies. But how many of you know, sometimes your enemies will find you? right? I mean, even when you're doing everything you can to avoid your enemies, sometimes your enemies will find you. And that's exactly what's going on in Exodus chapter 17. The Amalekites have found the Israelites and put them in a position where they have to stand and fight. But this is when Moses does something very interesting. He actually tells Joshua, okay, listen, we got to stand and fight today. And so I want you to go out to battle tomorrow. I want you to meet the Amalekites. And here's what I'm going to do. While you're out there fighting, I'm going to go up on a nearby hill so that I can oversee the battle. But more importantly, I'm going to go up on the hill so that I can raise the staff of God. I'm going to raise my staff in the air toward God heaven. Now, what you need to know is that the staff of Moses wasn't just some ordinary staff. This staff represented the power of God. In fact, the people had seen this staff in action on multiple occasions. They had seen God work through Moses' staff. For example, when Moses first went to Egypt, he talked to the Pharaoh, and to demonstrate God's power, he took his staff, he threw it on the ground, and it turned into a snake. The Pharaoh thought, well, that's a pretty good trick, but my magicians can do that as well. And so he brings in some magicians. They throw down their staffs. They turn into snakes too. But Moses' staff, guess what it does? It eats the other snakes, all right, proving that God is more powerful than their gods. Well, shortly after that, the Israelites, they leave Egypt, and on their way out the door, they they get trapped between the Red Sea and Pharaoh's army. Pharaoh decides, I don't think I want to let those people go so quick, and so he sends the army out to recapture the Israelites and bring them back to Egypt, and so they're stuck between the Red Sea, and they're stuck between the army of Pharaoh. What does Moses do? 
He raises up the staff of God, and what does God do? God parts the water, they walk across on dry land, drowning out the Israelite army. But this was also the staff that was used in the desert to provide for the people. So the people are wandering around in the wilderness. They don't have anything to drink. They need water. And so God tells Moses, take the staff and tap the rock. And as soon as Moses tapped the rock, guess what happened? All these millions of gallons of water begin to rush out so that all of the Israelites could get something to drink in the desert. So this was no ordinary staff. This represented the power of God, and this staff was going to lead the people of Israel into victory against the Amalekites, which brings us to verse 10 of Exodus chapter 17. It says this, so Joshua fought the Amalekites as Moses had ordered, and Moses and Aaron and Hur went to the top of the hill. As long as Moses held up his hands, the Israelites were winning. But whenever he lowered his hands, the Amalekites were winning. When Moses' hands grew tired, they took a stone and put it under him, and he sat on it. Aaron and Hur held his hands up, one on one side, one on the other, so that his hands remained steady until sunset. So Joshua overcame the Amalekite army with the sword. Now, real quick, I want you to do something with me, okay? All those of you at home, too, you've got to play as well. I want you to do something with me, for me, with me. I want, you to, I want you to throw your hands up in the air, okay? Wave them like you just don't care. I'm, I'm kidding. Don't do that. Oh, you are waving. Good. <laughs> hold your hands up in the air. I, I hope your deodorant's working just fine uh, today. So hold your hands up in the air. Now, the text tells us that uh, Moses had to hold his hands up. Actually, the text doesn't tell us, but we can kind of assume that Moses probably had his hands raised for about 14 hours. How many of you know that it's a long time to hold your hands in the air for 14 hours? Yeah, yeah, all of you, right? You've all got your hands up right now. I'm not, uh, oh, because I told you to. That's right, that's right. Keep, keep them up. Don't, don't let them down. Don't let them down. Now, now, Moses had his hands up from sunup to sundown about 14 hours. We've had our hands up for about 14 seconds, and we're already starting to feel the burn, aren't we? We're already starting to get tired, aren't we? We're already to let our hands up, but don't do it. I want you to keep your hands in the air. In fact, uh, as I was reading the story, I started thinking about an exercise called planking. How many of you have heard of planking? I think all of us have heard of planking. Well, a planking exercise happens like a push-up. You get down on the ground and you rest on your elbows. You rest on your toes. Don't, don't, don't drop your hands yet. Keep them up. Keep them up. You rest on your toes and then you get stiff as a board like a plank. And it's really supposed to work your core, right? So if you've ever seen somebody doing the plank, if you've seen somebody planking, when you're looking at it, it looks pretty easy, right? Like you're looking over there, you're thinking, I could plank for probably five or six hours. I mean, I could probably plank for five or six days if I had to. I mean, look how easy that is. And it looks easy until you get down and start trying to plank, okay? Keep your hands up. Don't drop your hands, all right? So you get down on the ground and you start planking and you're fine for the first 15 seconds. But then about, I don't know, 30 seconds in, what starts to happen? Man, your core starts to burn, right? And about 40 seconds in, your elbows start to hurt. And pretty soon, your, your body starts shaking. You're like, man, I don't even think I can make it one minute. You finally get to 60 seconds, and you just fall to the ground. You can go ahead and put your hands down at this point. Woo, doesn't that feel better right there? Amen. Well, <laughs> Moses is holding his hands up in the air, and I'm sure that when he thought about this plan, he thought, well, that won't be that difficult, Right? But he didn't think it all the way through because as you just experienced, <laughs> right, if you've got your hands up in the air for a long time, they start to get tired. And so what happens to Moses when his hands start to get tired? The text tells us that his hands start to fall like this. But when his hands come down, what happens to the Israelites? They begin to lose the battle and the Amalekites begin to win the battle. And so what does Moses do? He throws his hands up real quick again, right? He's holding the staff up in the air, holding his hands up. And all of a sudden, the Israelites start to win and the Amalekites start to lose. But sure enough, after a little bit, Moses starts to get tired. He starts to feel the burn, right? He's starting to get sore, and his, his arms are coming down. He doesn't want to, but eventually he's like, man, i got to shake some blood back into my hands. And the Israelites start to lose, and the Amalekites start to win. So Moses throws them back up like that. But sure enough, after a few more minutes, his arms start coming down. And I don't know how long this goes on, but eventually he's got two buddies with him. He's got Aaron, and he's got her with him. And what do they do? They say, 
we got to do something. We notice anytime Moses' arms come down, the Israelites lose and the Amalekites win. So we got to do something. So they grabbed the rock. They said, Moses, sit on this so you can rest your body and just focus on holding that staff in the air. And then they got on either side of Moses, one on one side, one on the other. They held his hands up in the air. And sure enough, the Lord brought about a great victory that day. The Lord led the Israelites to defeat the Amalekites that day, but that wasn't the end of the story. In fact, let's pick back up in verse 14. It says this. It says, then the Lord said to Moses, I want you to write this on a scroll as something to be what? To be remembered. And make sure that Joshua hears it because I will completely blot out the nation of Amalek from under heaven. So Moses built an altar and he called it, the Lord is my banner or Jehovah Nisi. And then he said, because hands were lifted up against the throne of the Lord, the Lord will be at war against the Amalekites from generation to generation. So what does it mean that God is Jehovah Nisi? Well, a Nisi is a banner, and a banner was used for a couple of different purposes. First of all, a Nisi would have been a symbol of power. Now, we might think of a Nisi as a flag, but back in the day, a Nisi would have been built out of a large piece of wood. It would have been built out of a large piece of reflective metal. And what armies would have done is that they would have, they would have embossed or they would have drawn a picture of their God on the front of their Nisi. Or they would have drawn the crest of their nation on the front of their Nisi. And then that image, that Nisi, would be carried out in front of the army as they went into battle. And so the Nisi would have been carried over the army, and it would have gone out before the army. In fact, this would have been the first thing that the enemy would have seen. I mean, before they saw how many soldiers you had, before they saw what kind of weapons that you had, they would have seen your Nisi. They would have seen your banner. Now, the Israelites didn't have a Nisi, like a flag, that way. Instead, they had the staff of God. But that represented power as well. It represented the power of God. That said, there was something else that a Nisi would do. A Nisi was also designed to inspire the troops. I mean, think about it. If you're a soldier and you're getting ready to go out to battle, wouldn't it be nice if you had your home country flag to go along with you? Because every time you look at your home country flag, it's going to inspire you, right? Or let's say you're on the field of battle and, and you're, you're, your army is winning. Well, it's easy to stay motivated. It's easy to keep going forward. But the minute you start losing, what do you do? You turn around and what do you see? You see your Nisi, right? And it would be a reminder. It would inspire you to turn around and keep fighting because... Everybody knew as they would see their Nisi that they were fighting for something bigger than themselves. Well, the Israelites weren't necessarily fighting for something bigger than themselves, but what their Nisi, what what the staff of God represented is the fact that there was somebody bigger than them who was fighting for them. So when we say Jehovah Nisi, the Lord is my banner. We recognize that we never go into a battle alone. We recognize that God is always watching over us and that God is always marching in front of us. And my prayer is that that truth, that this name, Jehovah Nisi, would really encourage someone today. In fact, there are two observations I think we can make on the name Jehovah Nisi. And so if you're taking notes, you can write this down, but this will be the first one. Uh, First of all, number one, no matter what battle you face, we know that the battle belongs to the Lord. No, No matter what battle you face, the battle always belongs to the Lord. Now, as soon as the battle was over, God had Moses do something very, very specific. Do you remember what it was? God said, here's what I want you to do, Moses. Now that the battle is over, now that I've given you the victory, I want you to write it down. I want you to pull out your diary, and I want you to write an entry. I want you to write down exactly what you saw happen today. So why in the world would God want Moses to record this event in his journal? Well, I believe it's because this was the very first battle that the Israelites 
faced. This is the first time the Israelites had to go out and fight an, another army, but God knew it might be your first battle, but it's certainly not going to be your last battle. And God wanted Moses to document what happened so they would not forget who God is. But there's another reason that I believe that God had Moses write this into his journal, and, and that would be for this reason. I believe that Moses wrote this down for you and for me. I, I believe that God wanted Moses to write this down because he knew that someday you and I would read this story and that we would take inspiration from this story. You say, yeah, okay, maybe, but I don't even know any Amalekites. I mean, what in the world does this story have to do with me? Well, you might not know any Amalekites, but I can promise at some point you're going to experience an Amalekite moment in your life. You, you might not even be looking for a fight, but sometimes you got to know that the fight comes looking for you, doesn't it? And some point, you got to remember who God is and what he does because all of us face battles in this life. You may face a battle in your family. You, you may face a battle in your mind. You may face a battle in your business. You may face a battle in your spirit. But the truth is, all of us are going to face battles. And so what I want you to do right now, if you don't have a pen or a piece of paper, I think you should get one, but I want you to write your battle down. What is it that you are fighting against right now? What, what is your struggle? Is it your job? Is it your marriage? Is it your kids? Is, is it your health? I want you to write it down. I want you to give it a name because we all have battles that we're going to face in life. Maybe for, for someone, you're, you're, you're a dad and, and you've been battling being the spiritual leader of your family. I mean, you, you want to lead, but every time you step into that leadership role, every time you try and lead your family closer to God, it just seems like nobody is listening. Or, or maybe for you, your battle is your, your finances. You've been trying to get yourself out of debt. You've been trying to create some margin in your, in your budget. But for whatever reason, every time you make a little bit of progress, you seem to fall deeper and deeper into the red. Or maybe for you, your, your, your battle is patience. You, you, you've got some employees that you want to be more gracious with, and so you're doing everything in your power to be more patient with them, but it just seems like that your employees don't want to follow the policies that you've put in place, and when they don't do it, man, patience just goes out the window. So what is, what is your battle? More importantly, what is your nisi? Because Jehovah Nisi reminds us that we never go into the battle alone. God always goes over us. God always goes before us. And God always fights our battle for us. I want you to check out what David says about Jehovah Nisi. This is Psalm chapter 60, verse 4. David writes this. He says, but you have raised a banner for those who fear you. I find it interesting that so many of us fear our circumstances, we fear our enemy. David says, no, 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 we need to fear God. We need to stand in awe of God. We need to understand who he is. We don't have to fear anything when we know God. But you have raised a banner for those who fear you, a rallying point in the face of attack. Now, I love this passage because it reminds us that all of us are going to face battles in our lives, but when we do face the battle, we don't run, we don't surrender, we don't quit, we don't walk away. Instead, what do we do? We, we look for a rallying point. We look for our Jehovah Nisa. We look for our banner. We, we, we go to God, and when we do, then we know that God is going to give us what we need to face the battle. It reminds me of a story I heard about a man who was walking through the jungle. He's walking through the jungle, and all of a sudden, uh, a lion spots him. And, and sure enough, you know, he hopes that the lion doesn't give chase, but sure enough, the lion starts chasing after this guy. And so he takes off running as fast as he can, but he knows he can't outrun the lion. And so he begins to pray, God, I need you to convert this lion into a Christian. And by the time he gets those words out of his mouth, I mean, just that fast, the lion stopped chasing. And so the man turned around, and sure enough, the lion's getting down on his knees. He's folding his hands and begins to pray, but the man can't hear the prayer. So he walks over closer so he can hear the prayer of this lion. And this is what he hears the lion praying. Dear God, 
bless this meal that I'm about to partake of. <laughs> bless it to nourish my body. <laughs> okay, listen, that's a, terrible, that's a terrible story. You shouldn't be laughing at that story. That's a terrible story. I'm not even sure what that means. But, but maybe you find yourself running today. Maybe, maybe it feels like you're under attack today. Maybe, maybe it seems like a lion is chasing after you. Listen, don't forget that conflict and hardships are a part of life, but the battle always belongs to the Lord. Which brings us to the second observation. Here it is right here. When we think about the battles in our life, no matter what battle you face, the battle is fought on your knees. No matter what battle you face, the battle is always fought on your knees. Now, in our text, uh, Moses tells Joshua, you need to go ahead and face the enemy. You need to assemble the troops. You need to go down, and you must stand, and you must fight. But Moses also knew something else. Moses knew that the battle is won through prayer. And the reason I say that is because what did Moses do? Moses went up on the hilltop, and he raised the staff of God in the air. And listen, I don't think he was doing this for show, okay? I don't think this was like a terrible towel moment where he's trying to cheer on the troops. I don't think it's like that. I think what Moses understood is that if they were going to win the battle, they were going to need the power of God. And so as he, as he raises his hand, it, it's actually a sign of surrender. And so he raises his hands, and he basically is crying out to God, God, we need you to supernaturally intervene. And so I believe that Moses, on that mountain, as he's raising his hands, he's just praying his guts out. He's, he's praying to the one that can bring victory to the Israelites. You see, Moses understood that even though the battle was taking place in the physical that really it was a battle that would be won in the spiritual. And so he prays to the Lord who's over both the physical and the spiritual. And and listen to me, the same is true for you and I. I I, I appreciate what the apostle Paul writes in Ephesians chapter six. He, He echoes kind of something very similar, if we can find that on the screen here, Ephesians chapter six. I'll just read it. How about that? I've got it right here. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on the full armor of God so that you can take your stand against the devil's schemes. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood. In other words, it's not not really about the physical, but it's against the authorities and against the powers of this dark world and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you will be able to stand your ground. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. And then he adds this, and pray, and pray in the spirit on all occasions with all kinds of prayers and requests. Now, I want you to notice a couple of things. First, I want you to notice that Paul does not say put on some of the armor of God, right? He doesn't say just put on one or two pieces, you'll be good. What does Paul say? He says put on the full armor of God. The truth is so many of us who are following Jesus are getting tore up in the battle because we aren't fully armored up with the armor of God. We're not fully suited up and ready for the fight. So Paul says, hey, you need to put on the full armor of God. But then he says another thing, one last thing. He says, once you put on the full armor of God, you're still not done yet. What did he say to do at the very end? He said, what you need to do next is pray. The the, the most important thing you can do is pray. Because prayer is the battlefield in which we fight. Prayer is the battlefield in which we fight our battles. And I believe it's because really what we're doing when we're praying is we're we are talking to, we are accessing the one who has the power and the strength to fight our enemies for us. It's so true for any of us. I've heard it said, you can't expect a million dollar miracle with a 10 cent prayer. <laughs> you can't, can't expect God to do really big things if you're not willing to put in the time and the energy in praying. That's why we're doing 21 days of prayer. That's why we're encouraging you to 
uh, limit something physical so that you can do something spiritual and so that you can tap into the power of God. Prayer is a direct access line to the Father. He's the direct access line to Jehovah Nissi, the one who is our banner, the one who goes before us and fights our battles for us. So some, some of you might be thinking at this moment, Pastor, you, you don't know my battle. You don't, you don't know my struggle. I mean, I mean I've, been, I've been fighting a long time. I've been praying hard for a long time, and it just doesn't feel like I'm winning. It just doesn't feel like I'm ever going to receive the victory in my life. Well, let's go back to Exodus. I'm sure that Moses didn't think at the beginning of the day when he raised up the staff, I'm sure that Moses didn't think, I'm going to be out here for a little while. I'm sure he was thinking, this is only going to take a few minutes. I mean, God is that powerful. He parted the Red Sea that quick. He can do something like that here. But, but in this situation, it took a while, right? It took 14 hours. He was raising his arms for 14 hours, but there's no way he could have done it by himself. Remember, he had a couple of buddies with him he had Aaron with him. He had her with him. And both of them held his arms up. And listen to me, if you're fighting a battle right now, that's exactly what you need too. Every single one of us need people who can come alongside of us, who, who can build us up, who can pray for us and, and, and walk through the journey with us and help us to get the strength that we need to endure. This past week, I spent some time talking to one of my buddies It'd been a while since I talked to him, maybe even since before COVID. Um, he called me this week, and, and, you know, he calls me every once in a while, and we, we catch up. But this, this, this time it was different. He called me, and I could just hear it in his voice that, that something wasn't right. And sure enough, he, he began to share with me from his heart. He, he told me, he said, uh, John, I've battled addiction for 15 years, the past 15 years, and uh, with God's help, I've been freed from that since March, haven't, haven't had a drop of alcohol since March. He said, but, but John, even though I'm free from the addiction, my heart is just filled with so much regret. He said, I, I want to be a better parent than I am right now. He said, I'm not, I'm not doing the job that I think God has called me to do right now. He said, I just, I just feel like a failure. I feel like I, I, I've been on this path and on this journey, and I, I haven't been doing what God's wanted me to do. I don't remember years of my life. He said, I'm just so lost. And I, I, I said this to him. I, every once in a while, I'll say something that I think is pretty good. Uh, usually, it's because God has helped me with saying something. And so in that moment, I'm just praying, God, what do you want me to say to my friend here? I mean, he's, he's hanging on by a thread, and he, he, you know, I, he needs help. He needs encouragement. What do you want me to say to my friend in this moment. And, I, and I, I, this thought just came to my head, but after he told me, I just feel so lost, I said to my friend, I said, listen, you're only lost if you don't want to be found. I said, but there's a, there's a God in heaven who loves you and cares about you and is close to you. He, he wants to have a relationship with you. I love you. I care about you. And, and the two of us together, we're willing to walk through this with you. And, and he said to me, he said, he said, thank you so much for sharing that with me. He said, I guess I've been walking by myself for so long that I forgot that I needed people with faith who can help build me up. I don't know what battle you're facing, but Exodus 17 reminds us the battle belongs to the Lord. It reminds us that the battle is won through prayer on our knees. But more importantly, we gotta have people with us. We gotta be surrounded by, by other Christ followers who can build us up. Why don't you stand? Hey, Providence, Pastor John here. Thank you so much for tuning in to today's lesson as we learned the new name of God, Jehovah Nissi, the Lord is my banner. You know, really, we learned two key thoughts today, and that is this. Whenever you face a battle, you got to remember that the battle belongs to the Lord 
And you got to remember that the battle is won on your knees. I don't know what battle you might be facing today, uh, but I want to encourage you. I want you to know that God is for you, that he is, he is fighting your battle for you. And if you feel like you've been fighting on your own, just know that there are people here at Providence Church who love you and care about you and want to fight the battle with you as well. But the truth is the battle is always fought on our knees. The battle is always won on the battlefield of prayer. That's because it connects us with God 100%. We are connected to the one who fights the battle for us. And so I'm going to encourage you, if you feel like you're in the battle, but you want to give up, you want to quit, you want to surrender, I'm going to encourage you not to do that. I'm going to encourage you to turn to Jehovah Nissi. He is our banner. He is our victory. And I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that he can bring you through if you'll just turn to him. Well, at this time, here's what I want to do. I want to give you a couple of questions that maybe you can think about on your own or discuss with your family or talk over in your house church. This is just an easy way for you to engage with the subject matter. And uh, here are the two questions. Whenever you think about a Nisi or a flag, what images come to mind? And then number two, what was the biggest takeaway for you from today's lesson? Well, once again, we hope that you are blessed as we study God's word together. We look forward to seeing you next week as we learn the final name of God.